Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you to the second launch of the Arua Profiles Report. Let me give you a bit of background to this report, which will then allow you, especially our colleagues from outside of Arua, uh, uh, namely the members of the Guild of European Research Intensive Universities and all others watching us uh, online. Arua began its uh, operations in 2015, but uh, we finally got going in 2016 uh, as a network of African uh, research intensive universities. The main motivation for coming together was to establish how we could work uh, as a collaborative, how we could use the strength of collaboration to support one another. Uh, we believed very strongly that uh, we came from very diverse backgrounds. There were universities in our midst that were very well endowed in relative terms, and others not so well endowed. We believed that uh, by working together, we will be able to capitalize on the strengths of all the members. Even for the very well endowed ones, it was the conviction that uh, through an engagement with the others, they will be able to enhance uh, in a much more significant way the work that they were doing. It's our ambition to make our universities in Africa increasingly globally competitive. And that globally competitive character will come from what we are able to do in the region and how we're able to impact the region. So if we want to be seen as global leaders in higher education, We've got to be seen to be engaged with our region and our communities. We thought it would be useful to be able to remind ourselves from time to time of where we were, where we come from, uh, by seeing what the state of the play was with regard to uh, production as a higher education institutions, by looking at how we compared with others within the region, and also how we featured outside of the region. That's why benchmarking was very important for us. Where have we come from? Where are we, are we going the right direction? We are very well aware of our challenges and all the handicaps that we face, we are aware of them. It's our desire to work together to overcome those challenges. So by getting support from the Carnegie Corporation to do this uh, benchmarking, gathering data, uh, it's our way of reaffirming our commitment to where we want to go by being able to remind ourselves from time to time where we've come from. Carnegie Corporation agreed to support us in 2016 to gather data, gather data on uh, students, gather data on staff, gather data on the research we we're doing, gather data on how the funding situation was. Uh, evolving. And we've been doing this since 2017. Uh, last year, we were able to launch a report that covered the period 2015 to 2017, in which more or less we provided the baseline for our evolution. Uh, today, we are launching our second report, which will cover the four year period of 2018 <laughs> to 2021. This allows us as uh, managers of uh, universities to see whether we are on the right track or not. It also allows others to take a peek into what Arua is doing. Is Arua doing the right thing? And is the right thing affecting the Arua universities and are they impacting their communities? It will take time for us to be able to provide the evidence, but this is the beginning. So I'm very happy that uh, you've joined us uh, to launch this first report. I can assure you that this first report, this second report is much better than the first report. And I can also assure you that the next one will be even better than this one. But uh, I'm very confident in what we are going to show you. 
uh, I'm very satisfied that every vice chancellor will be able to learn something from it and inform his or her council on how the university should be better governed. So I welcome you to this event and I do hope you enjoy it and uh, you'll be able to follow ROS progress over time. Thank you very much. Let me now invite our board chairman, uh, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, who is the uh, vice chancellor of Makerere University to give us his opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Ernest. Good evening. I would like to welcome all of you and particularly our visitors from the Guild of uh, the European Universities. Uh, we thank you for coming to brainstorm with us on what we African universities should be doing to turn around the situation in Africa. Africa is facing many challenges. Some of those are extremely difficult even to think about. When you think of the fact that by 2050, or is it 2100, every second person on earth will be living in Africa. That somehow frightens us. And what can we do as universities to make sure that that doesn't become a catastrophe? that we don't look on as a bad situation becomes worse and maybe leads to disasters. Because if we just sit and look, then we should expect very unstable nations in Africa, which will definitely affect the whole world. Issues of climate change, issues of disease, emerging diseases, but more importantly, issues of the very many young people that will flood streets looking for jobs which are not there now. What can we do as universities? African universities face special challenges. As you are aware in the days of the so-called structured adjust adjustment programs of the World Bank, funding to universities in Africa practically froze and that's why universities were forced to begin commercialization of programs. If some of you have read a book by one of our professors called Mamdani, he says, well, I think metaphorically, he said there was a meeting in Harare where the World Bank practically told African vice chancellors that Africa does not need universities because you can send those who want to study to America and the Europe. You need to concentrate on basic education. And the governments believed them. And so they basically froze funding. And that has had a devastating effect. They have had a change of mind. But after that very devastating moment. So we are here as a Rua to see what we can do to change the situation around. If we are contributing just 3% of knowledge production, and yet we contribute almost 20% of the population of the earth, there's something wrong. Can we correct that? And I'm happy that we have friends who would like to work with us to change the situation around. So you are welcome. I hope you enjoy your stay with us, that you brainstorm with us on how can we jointly change the situation around. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nawangwe. It's now my pleasant duty to invite our host, the chair, the, the vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town, Professor Mamukati Pakin.
Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. Welcome to Cape Town if you come from outside Cape Town. And we, at, as the University of Cape Town, we are pleased to host you here, not just for the Arua board meeting, but for the launch of the institutional profiles. We are glad that Arua chose UCT for this launch. Not because, of course, this is the best location if you want to do the best research. I mean, we are the meeting point of two oceans. We are in close proximity to the darkest place where we host our square kilometer array um, uh, project. And we, we, of course, here in Cape Town can boldly talk about our strengths um, coming as a result of our geography, all between the skies and the ocean and everything in between. You want to see the world in one place, you come here, the best of it and the worst of it. You want to see the inequalities in the world, you come here, you'll see it here. You want to, to see the best that we can, you, you get it here. So we are delighted that you chose the University of Cape Town. But why is this launch key for us? It's because we, we are an alliance and we as the University of Cape Town regard Arua as a key network. It's our number one network. We've, we belong to several networks, but Arua is our number one network because it is home. And we, we in our vision 2030 have committed ourselves to unleashing human potential for a fair, to create a fair and just society. And there's no better way of doing that as institutions of higher learning than through our research but we can only do it better through working with others. And this report that we're launching today gives us an opportunity to get to know each other a little better as institutions. But not only that, to say to those who want to work with us, this is a little of who we are. Of course, the data goes only, I think until 2018, 2018. 2021, but, but it's, it really gives you a sense in terms of the, the postgraduate students, how we focus on postgraduate studies. And we'll see the large number of student bodies that uh, we have different universities have in postgraduate studies. In terms of the staff who have PhDs, but also in terms of research productivity. And of course it forces us to ask different questions. Why do we, as African institutions, believe that a PhD is an important qualification to have here in the continent? Why do we want a drive for more PhDs? For us, it's not just about research productivity. And you will see when you look at the report, there may be a disjuncture that it doesn't necessarily mean the university that's got the highest number of staff with PhDs. It's not necessarily the one that produces the highest number of outputs. The people in different institutions on the continent, PhD graduates, make different kinds of contributions in different countries here in this continent. And it's some, and it's some conversation with those who collaborate with us that we need to get into and understand better. Often we think PhDs, when we think PhDs, we think only that its use is only in research productivity, but it's in way more than that. And, and this report, opens the window for deeper conversations between us, but also between us and future and current collaboration, collaborators. So welcome. I hope whilst you are here, if you come from a different place from outside Cape Town, you'll make time to see a little bit of this beautiful city. I can confidently say Cape Town is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Note, I didn't say University of Cape Town is the most beautiful campus in the world. <laughs> I just said the city, but in the process of you touring Cape Town, you might want to have a look at the University of Cape Town. Uh, so enjoy Cape Town, celebrate with us as we, 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 we launch this report and come back and we can work together more. Welcome.
All right, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Gerald Omar. Um, those who live in this country know that Omar means grandmother. Um, I'm sure I don't look like one. <laughs> Grandfather, Upa. <laughs> thank you. So, <laughs> so this is the second part of this project. The first part covered 2015, 2017. And now we've added 2018, 2021 data, but we're presenting the entire seven year period together. So you can see the trend and, and some of the strides that have been made, some of the changes that have taken place. Um, so I'm trying to, oh, okay. So this, this is what uh, this presentation is about, a little bit about the objectives of the project, the significance of the project. The SG spoke about most of that. Then we'll go into the profiles and then look at the bibli a, a bibliometric analysis, looking at uh, patterns of uh, publication outputs in this uh, uh, network, look at uh, citations as well, look at areas where researchers in these 16 universities uh, are, are publishing, the areas in which they're publishing the most. Um, I think I need to be patient with this thing. Okay. In terms of the objectives, these were the main objectives. Collect data to you know, see how you're performing, looking at how peers are performing and you know, seeing what possibilities are there, look at gaps in institutional capacity to gather and analyze data to inform particular indicators. This has been very, very important. Then build capacity for developing appropriate institutional structures and expertise for gathering benchmarking uh, data. A lot of this has, ha has been happening. Um, I think, uh, when was that? We had these uh, tours by universities from uh, uh, outside of South Africa, visiting universities in South Africa to look at their data systems, to look at their processes, look at governance structures, look at the kinds of capacities that uh, are required to support the collection and processing of data so that one can then engender a data evidence-driven decision-making culture. So, uh, but in this presentation, I'm just going to talk about the, the research profiles. Um, In terms of the significance of the project, we already spoke about benchmarking, tracking performance is very important. We'll see over the seven year period, some changes have happened, but it's also important, you know, if we want to set targets, if you want to intervene, so you'll see in the data, postdoctoral fellows, it's an area that might require intervention. You will see in the data, the representation of women academics is an area that might require intervention. You'll see in the data, the enrollment of women in doctor programs might be an area that also requires intervention. And also when you look at the areas where you're publishing, probably there might be a need for us to look at it and discuss and see if there are not other areas that we might want to also focus on and lift the excellence in those areas. So also, of course, obviously when you're talking data, it's also about supporting uh, decision-making. So this is very important. If you're thinking joint research, if you're thinking uh, about identifying areas of strength, internal differentiation for institutions. You'll see in the data when we show you uh, uh, um, the shape of the postgraduate enrollment, for example, you know, uh, the distribution of M and D students across various broad knowledge fields. Are these, are these things that have just happened anyhow? Is this planned? Is this the direction the institution wants to take? or something like that. Then of course, steering alignment uh, 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 with the Arua's objective, this is linked uh, to the second uh, uh, objective there. So Arua has a strategic plan. And some of the things Arua wants to achieve in the next 10 years, Arua universities, uh, or drive research uh, output on the continent so that it accounts for at least 5%. I think SG, this is a bit modest, maybe we should make it 10, 15% over the next 10 years. Then I like that the other objective there, 75% of staff uh, should have PhD over the next 10 years, uh, strengthening and developing good quality PhD graduates, strong links with other university and industry, universities and industry. And we'll see in the data, you know, it speaks to some of these objectives. Of course, driving institutional change and improvement or assessing improvement over time. Now, let's start looking at, uh, let's look at the data. This is the data that we gathered. 
We looked at academic staff profile. It's important. It gives you a sense of the capacity that you have, uh, uh, the makeup, the shape, and, and, and size as well, critically important. We looked at postgraduate enrollments. Uh, we looked at the various fields in which they enrolled. We looked at their representation within the total student cohort. Then we looked at, uh, 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 you need money to do research, isn't it? So we looked at funding and, and there are very interesting patterns there as well. Uh, you'll see during the COVID year, there seemed to be a decline in the funding that universities were able to raise. Then postdoctoral fellows, this is quite interesting. We've had very robust discussions around postdoctoral fellows, their importance you know, in terms of growing our own timber. Uh, publication output, now this is the bibliometric analysis, all the way down to patterns of co-authorships. We'll see some very interesting patterns there in terms of who our academics are, uh, are, are collaborating with. Now, in terms of the shape of the postgraduate enrollment, this is how it looks like, looks like if you look at the master's and doctoral enrollments. In the report itself, we include other enrollments owners and post post uh, graduate diplomas but we thought let's just focus on this for this particular uh, uh, launch and this is the picture there has been growth generally across pretty much most of the institutions you'll see for example ghana from 14 percent to 19 percent makerere from nine percent to 11 percent even though ibadan's proportion declined it's still very big this is as a percentage of the total student enrollment undergraduate and postgraduate. So this is the trend colleagues, you see uh, 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 some of them, if you look at the shape of the graphs, some of them are fairly stable, fairly stable even though there's no decline. But this is how it looks like, University of Nairobi, it's grown as well from 6%. Now why we only have data for University of Nairobi and Mauritius for the 2018, 2019 period, it's because this is the period when we've collected data from these two institutions, but we're in discussions and see, to see if we, we can't get the data for the other period as well so that we can have a full trend. And I should also mention that the investor of Rwanda, uh, which is not included at this juncture in this report, uh, has since given us some useful data. And so SG, we should be able in another two weeks time, Professor Bideria has confirmed that we'll have the full set and be able to include the investor of Rwanda here as well. Okay. Now, let's look at doctoral enrollments and look at Ibadan. This is quite strong. 12% of the entire student population at Ibadan is doctoral students. Uh, uh, uh. And then you'll see UCT is approaching 8%, which is very good. UKZN, 7%, uh, UP5. Look at VIT, 6%. So there's been growth generally. Uh, we've, we've had some fluctuations here and there, but generally there's positive growth. Uh, University of Nairobi declined a little bit. Now, I should add here, colleagues, that this, where there is a decline, it does not mean that the numbers reduced uh, in real times. You know, it's just that there was stronger growth in other areas. Okay, so then the graduate enrollments grew faster than the others, but, but there is positive growth across almost uh, all the institutions. Now, if you look at enrollment by gender, again, the shape of the graphs gives you a sense of, you know, how it looks like. Uh, again, there was generally positive growth across most of the institutions. A few institutions declined a little bit. Uh, Ghana, for example, you know, from 41 in 2015 to 35. Uh, uh, Ibadan, 63%. Um, no, no, Ibadan, it, it, it improved. Uh, you'll see it also improved. Roads improved quite significantly from 49% to 32% um, to 38%. Uh, um, so this is how it looks like, colleagues, it's, it's grown. So yes, granted, women are still underrepresented, <laughs> okay? But there has been positive growth, okay? Um, in terms of uh, fields of study, now this gives us a sense of the points of concentration where the bulk of our postgraduate students enrolling, masters and PhD students. Now you'll see roads here, for example, you know, you can see it's, you know, distinct majority of your students, 36.8% uh, are enrolled in the natural sciences. And then you'll see the other institutions there, you know, about, it's quite a strong, strong drive there. Um, and, and, and roads is much yeah, but the actual numbers prof have increased. <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of engineering, Nairobi, you can see over there uh, uh, is, is the bulk of the enrollments are in, 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 in engineering. 
interesting because this is the one area where most of the universities, the proportion of enrollments are relatively low. Okay. But you'll see, you know, University of Nairobi there is doing quite well. Uh, you see UP uh, is also doing very well. There are VITs there as well. UCT, of course, also doing very well in terms of engineering. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, this is medical. Again, University of Nairobi, almost, uh, that's 43%. It's the bulk of, of the enrollments are in the medical uh, and health sciences. And then we'll see we've got a number of other institutions in that space as well. UCT, you'll see VITs you'll see uh, Makerere also in that space. The next one is uh, agricultural sciences. Now, a number of the universities in the rural network do not offer programs in agricultural sciences. So that's why they're not represented here. A good example is roads. They don't offer agricultural sciences. So that's why they're not here. Now you'll see UK seems to lead particular field, albeit only 22% into Makerere is also very player there, University of Nairobi. All right. The next one is social sciences. Interesting. This is the one field where there is fairly strong all the universities. Okay. Uh, uh, you'll see uh, enrollment in 2021, if I'm mistaken. It shares that to so Dar es Salaam sitting at 33%. You can see quite a number of them. It's over 20%, with the exception of Mauritius and Nairobi there. Of course, that is to be expected if you consider that the bulk of the enrollments in Nairobi is in medical and health sciences, as well as engineering. Okay, so some other fields will definitely attract few enrollments. So the social... Oh, thank you. Fairly well represented, not as much as the social sciences. Uh, sorry, that was inadvertent. I'll try to go back. Humanities, yes. So you'll see uh, University of KwaZulu Natal, you know, the, the number has grown, the proportion has grown uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, year on year. There's year on year growth, currently sitting at 33.5%. And then we've got quite a number of institutions where the enrollment is fairly strong. UDSM 21%, University of Sheikh Anta Diop sitting at 21%. Uh, Ghana, I think, has the lowest enrollment, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, it's University of Nairobi, 4%, and then Ghana with 3, 7.3%. Uh, uh, now, let's look at uh, economic and management sciences here. Now, look at Ghana. This is what we saw with Nairobi in medical and health sciences, you know, where there's a very strong concentration. Nairobi was sitting at 43% in in health and medical sciences. University of Ghana is sitting at 45%, marginally declined from 46%. A number of them, the figures are fairly stable, you know, still from 25 to, to 27%. Uh, look at UCT there, fairly within a small range, 17.3% to almost 20%. Okay, now let's look at doctoral graduates. How does the shape uh, look like by gender? So this is how it looks like, of course. Um, if, if there's no strong representation in enrollments, we cannot magically expect a strong representation when it comes to graduates. But the good news, colleagues, is that there has been growth, albeit marginally, across most of the institutions. So there's been a fairly good growth across uh, 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 most of the institutions. Um, I'm trying to see, where is Rhodes? Yes, you see, from 40% sitting at 58%. Uh, 48 percent and quite a number of other institutions where the, the representation of women has grown fairly strongly we have a few where it's it's gone it's gone slightly down uh university of nairobi is a distinct leader here you know from 61 percent to 80 percent uh representation of women okay <laughs> um now the internal efficiency of postgraduate education is very important how long do our students take to complete their studies? And so we're looking at the proportion of postgraduate students, doctoral students in this instance, who completed their studies within four years. Again, like the other trends, we see general growth. You know, there's, there's good improvement across most of the institutions. 
with a few exceptions where it went down, but generally the numbers improve. You know, Ibadan, albeit marginally 56, 57%. Look at Makerere, you know, uh, this very strong growth from 21% to 47%. This is quite, quite strong. And so you see, we see similar trends where there's growth across quite a number of the institutions. Of course, we were a few exceptions, uh, University of Ghana, where it went down to 50% and, and, and uh, Mauritius uh, from 13 to 10%. Okay. Postdoctoral research fellows. Now, this is important, as I mentioned earlier, this probably might be an area where uh, a Rua might want to look at. Uh, uh, of course, there's a challenge around who a postdoctoral research fellow is. <laughs> but, but from the discussions that we had the past two and a half days, we, there's a shared understanding that there's a need for postdoctoral research fellows. So a lot of them are in South African universities. You can see you know, uh, quite some significant numbers across the South African universities, Rhodes, uh, Stellenbosch, UCT, UKZN, UP, and WITS. But it's quite pleasing to see you know, the numbers across the other institutions as well. Ghana almost doubled from 2018, 12 to 24. Look at Makerere, uh, 52, 72, fluctuated, came down to 14%. A lot of this is also influenced by funding, you know, because you need to provide support for the students to be able to do their work. Uh, Dar es Salaam, there's some, something happening there. Uh, Addis Ababa as well, from four to 10. Makerere, uh, five to 14. Sorry, we've got two Makereres. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, in terms of permanent academic staff, this is very important. Prof. Mamoheti touched on this. Uh, um, what, what kind of capacity do we have? If you're talking research, the understanding is you need people to have PhD to do research. Uh, the Secretary General talks about, I mean, the strategic plan for Rua talks about at least 75% over the next 10 years. So this is the picture, colleagues. You will see that in most of the institutions, majority with, with a few exceptions, uh, over 50% of the permanent academic staff cohort have PhDs. So you will see Ghana, you know, over uh, sitting at almost 70%, declined a little bit. Again, it does not mean that they... <laughs> The, the numbers went down. It just means that they appointed a lot more uh, academic staff who did not have PhD. Or probably there was an understanding that they would complete and they're still completing their studies. Okay, so you'll see UCT, it's grown. Uh, it's fairly stable, but slightly declined, 67% to 66%. Uh, Stellenbosch University has grown. Rhodes, this is quite significant, uh, uh, from 44% to, to 60%. Uh, I'm sure you're aiming for 80. <laughs> okay, thanks. Then Sia Di Sababa there has also quite uh, done a good job. University of Nairobi, fairly stable. Uh, Mauritius has also improved. The general trend across the board, colleagues, is that there has been some growth, okay, or some improvement. Proportion of women academic staff, again, the shape of uh, the academic staff core, this is how it looks like. Again, we've had some general improvement across most of the institutions. Uh, some of the improvements have been you know, marginal, but improvements all the same. In a few instances, the numbers went down. And again, it was because of stronger growth, you know, uh, 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 more men being appointed in these positions. So you'll see you know, the, the, the degrees of growth you know, varying across the various institutions, Ghana from 27 to 29%. Uh, UDSM 26% in 2018 to 28%, and then uh, uh, UP 50% to, to 50, 55%. So there is a fairly stronger representation of women, uh, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, in the South African universities. Okay. Okay, so again, the shape of, of the academic staff uh, cohort. Why is this important? We just want to understand, you know, who are your senior people? Um, because the expectation is these are the people who are going to supervise. These are the people who are going to work with doctoral and postdoctoral fellows. These are the people who are going to do research and lead research and assume the role of uh, PI, for example. And so this is what the picture looks like. Now, what is quite interesting here for most of the universities, the rural universities, the bulk of the academic staff cohort, they're senior people. And, and in some of the institutions, by, by far, you know, look, look, uh, 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 where are these guys? Yes, look at Mauritius, 
74.2% of their staff are senior lecturer, associate professor, and professor. And, and we see the same kind of trend, you know, look at uh, Sheikh Anta Diop, 72%. Uh, look at UCT, you know, 75%. But generally, the, the point here is that a significant majority of academics in Arua universities are senior people, okay. Now, if you look at gender, again, there has been some growth, but women remain uh, underrepresented. In some instances, we've seen a decline. Again, as I mentioned, it's not because women were fired, it's just because they appointed more men. So you'll see, for example, Ghana here, so 16% to 12%, uh, Ibadan, 24% to 23%. But we've also had uh, 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 areas uh, where we've, we've, we've had some, some, some good growth. Look at UCT from 25% to 35%. And we have quite a number of such cases across quite a number of the institutions. Uh, look at Lagos there from 30%, uh, growing to 34%. Okay. Now, in terms of research funding. So this is quite important. You know, we've had fluctuations year on year, but uh, one of the interesting trends, colleagues, is the 2020 data. You know, we see a decline at most of the universities, with the exception of just about one or two uh, universities. I think it's, it's, it's bits where there's no decline, but most of the other universities, if you look at uh, 2020, look at 2019, 2020, look at Ibadan, you know, from two, two million uh, dollars, $2.6 million to um, uh, uh, just about $790,000. Uh, look at uh, roads from uh, $19 million to $17 million. We see almost the same trend across most of the universities. A UCAD from 14 million to just about $1 million. Uh, but VITS, as I mentioned, is the exception here. The picture is actually more interesting when you look at the disaggregated data. So you'll see, for example, that uh, VITS and uh, 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 Addis Ababa, they're able to attract fairly significant funding from within the continent. Because that was one of the concerns that we're not leveraging, I think my career as well, Prof. Uh, uh, leveraging you know, funding from within the continent. So we've seen you know, government funding is still very strong across many of the, 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 uh, 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 the universities. But it was, it was quite interesting to see that you know, the, the scope is quite broad from a diversification point of view. Okay, now let's look at patents. This is how the picture looks like. Uh, quite a number of fluctuations across a number of the universities, uh, uh, Ibadan from seven in um, 2015 grew to 17 in 2021. Of course, there were fluctuations in between. And this is, this is how it looks across the board. Look at VITS at uh, 10, 23, 32, then 11. Uh, 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 Mauritius has been very stable at one. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now let's look at the bibliometric analysis. So briefly colleagues, what we did here was, uh, and I need to acknowledge the input of the two Emmanuels uh, who assisted with this, and of course, uh, Hussein, who assisted with putting all these together. So we looked at the web of science, of course, understandably, the web of science has got some limitations, but it gives, gives us a good sense of what's going on. We know it's probably not comprehensive enough, we know the social sciences are probably not as represented as the other fields of study. But the idea is just to get a sense, how does the landscape look like? Now, look at the growth. So by an average of about 9% per annum. And, and if you look at some of the analyses that have been done, I have in mind uh, the analysis by Francois van Schalkpeek and uh, Tyson and Nico and Johan Mouton, where they say one reason we're seeing this growth is because a lot more journals in which our academics are publishing are now becoming part of the web of science. Okay, so, so this, is, but, but the good point, I mean, the, the good news is that it's growing. And you'll see there, if you look at the point there, cumulatively, Arua University has published 117,715 uh, articles over the seven year period. Now, Let's look at some other interesting uh, 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 dimensions. So this, this is the individual university. So this is cumulatively, just looking at what they are producing, general articles. So the, there's no fractional counting here, it's just the article itself. Okay, so this is what the picture looks like. So we've got these two clusters. 
want of a better word. So this, these are South African universities. But the good, the good news is not necessarily that the South African universities are here, uh, is that there is growth, you know, even these ones, you can see there's, there's some upward growth. The pace may not be, you know, that uh, uh, steep, but there's growth. Okay. Now, if you look at, so we decided to look, that, those are the total publications. So let's see how it looks like when you compare it to the permanent academic staff that these institutions have, okay? And, and, and this is the trend. This is what we see. You'll see, for example, uh, uh, at UCT, I think this is UCT, the blue, uh, this one, this is UCT. So the numbers grown per permanent academic staff, looking at the article from just under 2.5%, uh, it's, it's now around about 3.7%. But there's been growth all along. You know, look at this also. They've, they've, they've grown fairly well. Uh, 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 who is this? Investor of Dar es Salaam. You can see, you know, uh, they're here is fairly stable, but there's growth nonetheless. Sheikh Anta Diop, also fairly stable. But you see the others, you know, University of Lagos, University of Nairobi. If you do a per capita kind of uh, analysis, you see that uh, uh, the productivity of, of academics is improving. Okay. Okay, let's look at citations. Uh, this is how it looks like. We're looking at it per, 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 per institution. Of course, it's cumulative. And so the picture you see here is, of course, naturally, the older publications attract you know, higher citations. So that's why it does not in any way suggest that the papers published in these uh, recent years were of poor quality. No, <laughs> it's just that um, from an age perspective, they're younger. So over time, um, I'm sure, you know, they will attract, uh, 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 you know, higher citations as well. And we'll show you, I think, in the, in the next slide, where we look at, uh, uh, at the citations on the continent, we compare with the others and see how we're performing. But generally, this is how we're doing in terms of citations. All right. Um, so if you normalize it, <laughs> this is how it looks a bit messy, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you can still extract sense out of it. So, <laughs> so this, this is the picture. Now, the, the general trend is that Arua is generally at par with the global average. And in fact, a number of Arua universities are way above the global average. Look at Lagos, look at Nairobi, look at Addis Ababa, look at Ibadan, you know, uh, twice as much as the world average. I can see Prof. Nongu smiling. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, so, this, this is the, the, the normalized citation impact. And again, as I said, colleagues, the general trend is at par with what uh, we see across the world. And, and we've got some universities that are outperforming or are performing way above the, 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 the global average. Okay. Now, in what areas, in what fields of, of research are uh, rural universities uh, performing very well? Now, I remember an article by uh, I think it was Francois Skalkfeik and Nico and Johan, where they were asking whether we need more prophets or engineers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm trying to be provocative, but this, these are the areas, uh, colleagues, where um, the bulk of our research is taking place. And you can see there's, there's some kind of alignment between the areas where a rural universities are publishing and, and the challenges on the continent and globally, you know, that uh, we are called upon to, to uh, contribute to addressing. So this is the picture, energy and fuels, veterinary, psychiatry, all the way down to economics, pharmacology, plant sciences, immunology. Now let's look at co-authorship, you know, what does the pattern look like? It's, it's quite interesting. Now the blue bars, or deep blue bars, these are international uh, collaborations with, with co-authors outside of the continent. And the bulk of the co-authorships are happening there. <laughs> so you'll see, for example, where is the University of Rwanda? You know, almost 90% of the work done by the University of Rwanda is done with peers from outside of the continent. Okay, so that's, that's, that's what we see there. Um, we also see, for example, that um, we, 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 our researchers also collaborating with colleagues in industry, you know, the smaller, the shortest bar there. So, so you see, for example, Rhodes University, 
you know, is, is doing fairly, fairly well there, relatively compared to the others, but it's an area where uh, 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 many of the investors, you know, are not, um, uh, have not registered many, many co-authorships. Now, if you look at, because Arua brings together, it's, it's like one big family, you know, what's going on within Arua universities? So this is the picture in terms of the co-authorships within the Arua network. And you'll see, you know, University of Cape Town leads at 35% in terms of their outputs that are co-authored with Arua universities. And so this is the trend. You see uh, uh, University of Nairobi, 28% there. Now, the thing is, if you disaggregate this further, You'll see, for example, most of the South African universities are co-authoring among themselves. So that's why you're seeing these, these very high proportions, relatively speaking. The reason for that is because they are, it's being steered you know, uh, in South Africa through various initiatives to get scholars within South Africa to work together and co-author and, and, and do work together. But this is the picture. Okay. So this is just in terms of the, 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 the actual outputs, you know, co-authored among Arua universities. This is what it looks like. As I mentioned, UCT is sitting at 38%. These are the actual numbers. Uh, we still see those two clusters uh, across uh, almost uh, all the, the dimensions. So, sorry. So in conclusion, So these are some of the key observations. There is general progress across pretty much all the dimensions that we looked at. You know, the proportion of postgraduate students is growing. Uh, the proportion of female students, they're still underrepresented, but we see some positive growth. The proportion of female academics, they're still represented, but there's some good growth there. Academics with PhDs, again, that's also growing. Now, if you look at uh, 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 the proportion, you know, the postgraduate, undergraduate proportion, yes, we've got quite a number of universities that are in the 40s, lower 50s, but the bulk of our rural universities are predominantly undergraduate universities. If you just look at the shape of the student enrollment. If you look at doctoral students who've completed uh, their studies within uh, 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 four years, we see tremendous growth across quite a number of the institutions, and Makerere, has performed distinctly well in this regard. It registered the strongest uh, improvement from 21.2% to 47% in 2021. We talked about uh, uh, the shape of the permanent academic staff cohort. Again, the majority of staff, in addition to having PhDs, they are also senior people. They're senior lecturers, they're senior uh, associate professors, and, and they're full professors. Now, if you look at the bibliometric, what we see is that uh, there is, again, you know, Arua universities are playing a leading role in advancing research on the continent. If you look at the publications output, if you look at the citations, if you look at the areas in which they are publishing. So this, this is quite gratifying. The research fields, as we mentioned already, align with the major, cha major challenges confronting not only the continent, but in fact, the world. Then we looked at the pattern, patterns of co-authorship. Uh, so, it's, it's quite high, you know, almost 90% for University of Rwanda. But, but if you dig a little bit uh, deeper, you see uh, amongst the rural universities is still slightly low. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the report. Thank you very much. Gerald, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, we are very pleased with the report that has been shared with us. It gives a lot of room for uh, thinking about how to move forward. It is now my, uh, surely, so we are Africans. In Africa, when we do things, we get to get some big man or, or, or big woman to come and launch it for us. And, and the biggest man I could find was uh, Sir Anton. So Sir Anton, please. Well, Ernest, uh, thank you very much for the very kind invitation to, to launch the report. And, but can I also thank all of, the, uh, all of Arua, all of the colleagues from Arua for giving us such a warm welcome on behalf of all of my colleagues in the 
Guild of European Research Intensive University. It's a real pleasure to be here with you over the next day or so. We really are looking forward to our discussions over the next day to, uh, to talk to you in concrete terms how we can work closely together. It's also a particular pleasure for me to be in South Africa because, um, as some of you may know, Glasgow actually has some very strong links to South Africa. Um, Nelson Mandela was uh, offered the freedom of the city of, the, of Glasgow in 1981. Uh, it was the first UK city to offer uh, him the freedom of the city. Um, and actually, even going further back in time, between 1962 and 1965, our students always have to elect, elect a representative to, from outside the university to our governing body. And they chose, actually, although uh, I don't think he was ever able to visit, they chose Albert Luthuli. Uh, who was uh, President General of the African National Congress to, to represent them. And, and so there's a strong bond between Glasgow and South Africa. So it's a very particular pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today. What I thought I would do, in addition to, of course, launching the report, which is, is it's a fantastic report, and I, I do commend you for doing this benchmarking work, uh, Ernest and colleagues, because I, I think it's really, really is important. But whilst launching it, can I also perhaps also foreshadow some of the things that we might do tomorrow, because I think one of the things certainly I've learned in my time at Glasgow, uh, and uh, I'll give you some examples from Glasgow, but frankly, any of my colleagues from around the Guild uh, from our side could give you similar examples from each of our, of our universities. What I've learned is just the depth of the import and importance of our partnerships that we've developed through the years. Um, so I think it's a, I think it's a very propitious moment uh, at the moment to to, to deepen those relationships e e even more. Um, so let me perhaps give you a couple of examples which I think illustrate the kind of issues that we will have to work together on as, as two networks. Um, um, and uh, apologies, because there are so many universities, of course, in Narua. I would have liked to use a, an example from each of you, and I probably could, but we'd be here for, for quite a long time. So I'll keep it, I'll keep it short. Um, I'll give you an example of, of two or three projects that we've worked together. For instance, we worked together with the University of Nairobi's Institute of Tropical and Infectious Diseases to deliver intensive training workshops in advanced genomic technologies uh, for Kenyan practitioners within public and veterinary health sectors. Uh, and, and this allows genomic technology to be used in the field. I was actually just yesterday, uh, before taking this flight uh, for Glasgow, well, two days ago, uh, before taking this flight to, to, uh, to Cape Town, I was with one of our virologists and, and she was telling me this fantastic work that is going that is taking place at the moment uh, with Makerere University and also the University of Dar es Salaam um, around the Aspire initiative, which is the second phase of the uh, Afrique One initiative, which is a consortium led by seven African institutions. And it's really looking at endemic zoonotic diseases and looking at how we can build capacity to fight these uh, in, in Africa. And looking beyond even tropical and infectious diseases, uh, some of our academics have joined academics from Addis Ababa, uh, looking at issues around how to manage livestock grazing in, in the, the Bali Mountains uh, National Park in, in, in Ethiopia. And then I, I was really interested to hear the report uh, earlier around how you're trying to really increase skills at both the M and the D level. Um, one of our colleagues in our computing science, one of our uh, assistant professors there, who is uh, from Nigeria, has been working together with both Lagos and, and Ibadan University on, on an annual Python programming workshop, which is now training hundreds and hundreds of students here. So these are examples from Glasgow, but if you took any of our universities in the Guild, you would see similar examples. And, but I think what they tell us, and I think what your report tells us, particularly uh, around the growth that our rural universities are experiencing is the following lessons. And I, and I hope we can hold them uh, in our sights as we talk to each other over the next day or so. Um, the first is the importance of uh, long-term investment. Um, I think whenever I speak to my colleagues, certainly my own university and their partners here in Africa, they say that what really matters is being together for the long-term. That's really what matters. It's not just partnerships which come and go with projects is how can you work together for a period of time to make a real impact and I think that's going to be I think the, the one of the things we have to bear in mind as we as we as we get together in the next day or so and think about how to take our initiatives forward 
the second is equity in partnership. And this came uh, up, uh, one of the reasons I was slightly later than my colleagues in, in the Guild arriving here in Cape Town is that the, we hosted at the University of Glasgow over the last two and a half days, uh, the Times Higher Education um, Global Sustainable Development Congress. And SDG 17, if you look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, is around partnerships. And for partnerships to be effective between the North and the South, there has to be equity in those partnerships. And I think, again, that is something that we need to bear in mind over the next few days. And then finally, and I, I think this speaks also to a point which the, your chairman, the, the vice chancellor from, of Makerere made, which is uh, uh, around just the contribution that Arua and indeed the Global South can bring to future partnerships. It's really, really important. Um, you, you mentioned, Vice Chancellor, that Africa has many problems and many challenges. But actually, when I look at many of the projects which my university does with your universities, they're providing the answers to humanity's global challenges for the 21st century. So I'm convinced that the vast majority of the answers around global challenges will come out of Africa. And I think that's, I think, one of the key things we have to bear in mind as we uh, have our discussions over the next few days. So coming to the report, I, I was hugely impressed. And, and again, uh, our colleague, Professor Uma, explained very clearly how, what a big impact that you've been able to have in a short period of time in gearing up your postgraduate education and really growing your numbers of publications in having an impact which normalized is really very significant compared to the global average. So I think all of this should give you heart that I think Arua and indeed many universities in this continent are really doing some extraordinary work and extraordinary work, which hopefully we can both leverage on each other and, and support each other over the next few years. So in conclusion, can I launch the report formally, Ernest? But above all, can I, I hope it's just a prelude. I hope it's a prelude to what we can all do together because I do think that what we can achieve together is much, much greater than what we can achieve as individual networks. Thank you very much. Should I start? Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to this exciting event. Uh, this report has been the product of years of work. It looks so clean and neat when you see the PowerPoints, but actually there, we know the amount of work and perseverance that was required to get to this point. Actually, we started this work back in 2007, talking about long-term partnerships supporting Hirana. Many of you know we started with eight universities and then evolved into Arua when Arua started in 2015. So I'd like to give a huge thanks to Ernest Aryuti, Gerald Uma, Emmanuel Adudanso, and the other Emmanuel at, and the Arua team, as well as the coordinators at the universities. This is only as good as the data that's coming from the coordinators. Thanks also for the vice chancellor support and to the universities who hosted many of the training sessions. That was a new element we added. And we can see that it's led to a lot more complete data um, this time. So the skills training has been a huge part of this process. And we hope this filters to other universities on the continent. As we know, data analysis is increasingly a component of decision-making. The bibliometrics are also a valuable addition to the report. So congratulations to the universities on the positive trends that we're really pleased to see. I hope this doesn't mean that you're going to relax, but that you're going to keep um, in the same direction. And especially despite COVID, I was really surprised that it, there was not a bigger impact on COVID, except maybe in the funding area that Gerald um, Uma pointed out. So this is something we can share with the Philanthropic Center, as well, of course, with our executive team. We are currently in a leadership transition in January, and this is an excellent timing to have this report. I hope we can consider other webinars where we have more time to discuss the data, what questions the data will help us answer, and also what it doesn't answer. 
and how we use the data for policymakers, as well as the components that we cannot measure and what are the data caveats and gaps? We actually had our own data analysis meeting at the corporation talking about philanthropic data. So this is really timely um, with this whole trend. I know the teams have had some of these discussions, but I think it would also be important for other stakeholders like funders, policymakers, as well as the private sector. <laughs> some targeted webinars with other groups that can benefit from this data. I know there are also a lot of other policy, uh, research and policy in higher education researchers that are on the call and we welcome comments from others as well. So I really see this report as a starting point for dialogue and I look forward to what is next. I would also like to mention that we're supporting some other research with the National Research Foundation looking at post PhD training programs. And that report is gonna be launched in on December 7th at the World Science Council. I just happened to have seen a draft and I think it's an excellent report as well. So I think the two of these reports really tell a powerful story about what's happening in the area of postgraduate and post PhD training. So a huge thank you to all involved. I'm very pleased to hear that you're going to be meeting in the following days, and I wish you well so that you can continue this conversation. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the engagement with Arua, and we look forward to working, continue to work with you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now invite our chair to give us the closing remarks before we have uh, our dinner. Yes. I, want, I want to thank uh, Professor Um and his team for a job well done. Uh, I think that report gives us a very good idea of uh, the state of our universities, the members of Arua. And I hope that it gives our uh, partners to be a good sense of why we are emphasizing doctoral training, creating more researchers for Africa. I think that's the main aim. How do we increase the number of researchers for Africa? The World Bank, has said that Africa needs to produce at least 100,000 PhDs in the next 10 years. And uh, I think they think that is a big number. And, and my question is, that is roughly the number of PhDs China produces every year. And their population is the same as the population of Africa. That is roughly the number of PhDs the United States produces every year. So why is the World Bank saying we should produce 100,000 in 10 years? We need to produce many more. The challenge is huge. Everybody says Africa is the next growth region, but it won't grow unless we produce a critical mass of researchers to handle all the issues that face this continent. I hope our partners are as excited as we are to get into this and produce more researchers for Africa. Because if we produce more researchers for Africa, we will contribute to making our world a better place. Thank you for accepting to come here and for accepting to work with us. Thank you, sir, for launching our report. Now that it has been launched by a big man, I am sure we are going to make sure we work to make it even better next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barnabas. So ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of uh, 
the launch program. Uh, we will now uh, reassemble elsewhere for dinner. And then we are, we are, I would, I'd like to let you know that uh, we are being hosted uh, by the University of Cape Town. Uh, they've organized everything that we've been doing so far. And uh, I won't get a chance again to let the Vice Chancellor know that we are extremely pleased with what we've received so far. And we do hope that uh, the rest will be equally good. Thank you. <laughs>